today the arrest in New York City of 17 individuals and charges in the United States and in Italy of over 200 individuals for drug related violations. The arrests began at 1.45 this morning. Ten of the subjects were partying at the Cafe Giardino. Coincidentally, as our agents entered the cafe, the entertainment had just ended. So as we broke in, applause broke out. With Rosario out of the picture, Joe's drug trafficking and tax evasion trials behind him, and John having recovered from a stroke, the two brothers went about their business as usual. The spotlight seemed to be off them for the time being, or so they thought and John and Joe stayed in the shadows, quietly maneuvering their way around any trouble that came their way. But a big problem had walked through the doors of Cafe Giardino, and it was a problem that was going to force the brothers into the biggest fight of their lives. In a 1989 interview with the New Jersey Courier Post, businessman Bill Kane described himself as Damon Runyon-esque, delving into bookmaking, loan sharking, burglary, and a lot of tough talking and chest puffing. He was even indicted in 1984 for his part in a 1974 murder. The charges were eventually dropped after it was discovered he was a liar who knew just enough about the murder to sound convincing when he talked tough to other crooks. Kane was also the owner of B&B Amusement Company, which had installed cigarette vending machines in Joe's Valentino's nightclub in Cherry Hill. The day after the devastating fire at the club in October 1982, Kane went to recover cigarettes that might have escaped damage from the fire. Previously, Kane only had a passing acquaintance with Joe, but while retrieving his undamaged cigarettes, he engaged in a much more in-depth conversation with Joe Gambino. That conversation eventually turned to the subject of video poker machines, which was a part of Kane's business. At some point, according to Kane, Joe brought up the idea of forming a business partnership to install video poker machines in Brooklyn. Even though he had heard the rumors about Joe's alleged mafia associations, Kane decided to give Joe the benefit of the doubt and went into business with him, with Joe supposedly becoming a secret partner in B&B. Kane claimed that his business partnership with Joe had blossomed into a friendship and he dined, fished and traveled with them, attended weddings and christenings with them, and even visited John's home in Florida. In that same Courier Post interview, Kane said that John and Joe control everything on 18th Avenue in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. That's the stronghold of the Sicilian Mafia in the United States, he said. Nothing moves there without Joe and John's approval. What that meant for Kane was that he had the market on the video poker machine business on 18th Avenue, and it allowed him to pull in over $300,000 a month in profits. He even had a machine inside the Cafe Giardino. Sometime between 1985 and 1987, a local FBI agent by the name of William Stolarski had approached Kane about helping the FBI obtain evidence that John and Joe were involved in an international drug ring, and he wanted Kane to help them prove that Cafe Giardino was a heroin auction house. The FBI called this investigation Operation Iron Tower, which was being conducted in conjunction with Italian authorities. The revelation floored Kane, and the idea of Joe and John being involved in drug trafficking didn't sit well with him at all, he told the newspaper. He thought it was un-American. Stolarski told Kane that the FBI was outmanned and outgunned and that they couldn't win without help from the silent majority. He also told Kane that a gangster dealing in drugs wasn't an honorable life and was poisoning children. 
Kane told the newspaper that after talking with Stolarski, he started noticing something strange about the Gambino brothers, even after being around them since 1982. It was a society where people whispered all the time and nobody works, he said. It was a place where everybody had a Porsche, Ferrari, BMW, and Mercedes, and no one works. There was more gold on people's necks and in their rings than Tiffany's had in its stores, he said. They drank Dom Perignon by the truckload, but nobody works. So, despite the fact that he really liked Joe, Kane agreed to help the FBI. After all, he told the Courier Post, he was a red, white, and blue patriot. I have a big American flag flying in front of my house, so how can I fly the flag and ignore the people who are trying to destroy my country? So, in 1985, Kane helped the FBI install bugs throughout Cafe Giardino, including above John's favorite table and in a video machine. Kane claimed the surveillance continued for three years until December 1988, but the FBI later contradicted those claims, stating in court documents that surveillance hadn't begun until March 1988. Despite Kane's assertion that the Gambinos had an extensive surveillance operation, which included sweepers and a cop who would identify FBI vans, the Gambino brothers were largely unaware of what was happening around them. The Bugs picked up many conversations, including one about a wine matter. Authorities claimed that the wine matter was code for heroin and not related to any legitimate wine importation matters. They said that the brothers and their co-conspirators were putting liquid heroin in bottles of Corvo brand Sicilian wine and moving it into the United States via the Dominican Republic. Authorities added that the Gambinos did this without the knowledge of the winery involved. The FBI claimed that Joe was in charge of the operation, and to prove their point, they claimed that Joe had traveled to the Dominican Republic in 1987 to meet with others involved in the scheme. There were also conversations of Joe and John speaking in the Sicilian language, apparently openly discussing their criminal activities. The FBI recorded hundreds of hours of conversations they claimed implicated the brothers in numerous crimes. On December 1, 1988, the Café Giardino was featuring a new Italian singer who was entertaining a crowd of about 100 people. Around midnight, just after the female singer finished her version of the classic Italian song, O Sole Mio, FBI agents, who were undercover inside the club, took to the microphone and announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this was your last dance. The crowd thought it was a joke until other FBI agents stormed the cafe and ordered everyone not to move. The raid, which took place concurrently in New York and Italy, resulted in over 200 arrests. Although Joe was arrested, John was not, because the FBI said they didn't have enough evidence against him. The following day, Joe was released on a $3 million bond and put on house arrest with electronic ankle monitoring. Shortly thereafter, Joe appealed to the court to have the surveillance tapes from Cafe Giardino thrown out. His first challenge was that Judge Constantino, who authorized the surveillance, hadn't read the 1,464 pages of documentation the FBI had given him to support their request. Apparently, the feds filed their application and the judge signed the order simultaneously at 11.51 a.m. on March 9, 1988. But Judge Leisure dismissed those claims, stating the court believes that Gambino bears a heavy burden to show that this respected federal judge signed an electronic surveillance order without considering, to his satisfaction, the material submitted in support of the government's applications. Joe also challenged the timing of the bugs on the grounds of illegal wiretapping, saying they were installed as early as 1985 at least according to Kane's claims in his 1989 newspaper interview. The FBI countered that although there were bugs in the Café Giardino back in early 1984 when it was known as Café Milano, no bugging took place prior to March 1988. But even so, the feds were forced to produce Kane for live testimony to settle the matter. Kane told the court that he never assisted the FBI in bugging the Café Giardino prior to 1988, and that he believed the Courier Post articles were not factually correct. In fact, he actually testified that he might have made that date up, referring to his interview statement about placing a bug above John's favorite table in September 1987. The journalist who conducted the interview, however, said he obtained proof about what Kane had told him. The writer's notes were subpoenaed to see if there was evidence of illegal bugging, but the journalist and the Courier Post successfully fought the court's subpoena. In addition, Joe referenced two lines in the Courier Post article to further his argument that the devices were installed prior to 1988. The article stated that Kane's video poker machines proved to be a good place to put listening devices, 
Beginning in 1986, they became a confessional for mafia crimes. But Kane denied ever even having video poker machines inside the Cafe Giardino at all and said he didn't know if there were bugs inside any of his other vending machines either. But despite the obvious contradictions, the court ruled in the government's favor, the tapes were here to stay. Eventually, Kane was branded as a liar by the prosecution themselves and was dismissed from any part of the forthcoming trial. Instead, the government pulled in another informant by the name of John Zarbano, who just happened to be a defendant in the same case as Joe and John. Since John hadn't been arrested in 1988, the government was itching to put him on this case. The prosecution wanted to prove that John was ahead of the Sicilian faction of the Gambino family and that he also headed an international drug ring that allegedly brought more than $200 million worth of heroin and cocaine into the U.S. And they thought John Zerbano was their key to the kingdom. Zerbano told the FBI that John had met with John Gotti in April 1987 and that Gotti had arrived at the cafe in a limousine with three bodyguards. Zarbana also testified that in March 1987, five different capos from five different Cosa Nostra families met with John Gambino in the back room of the Cafe Giardino. The capos went back one at a time, Zarbano said, and discussed business with Gambino. Based on Zarbano's testimony, the government finally got their man. John was arrested on January 4, 1990. He was charged with narcotics trafficking, illegal gambling, loan sharking, and extortion. He was released the next day on $2 million bond and was placed under house arrest with electronic bracelet monitoring just like his brother Joe. Later, Zerbano changed his mind about what he said and accused federal prosecutors of pressuring him to testify falsely against the Gambino brothers. He claimed the prosecutors tried to get him to lie and corroborate another witness's story and to involve John Gambino in drug deals and murders he didn't know about. John Zerbano was also dismissed from the case. But the government wasn't about to give up and found a trio of informants who they believed would help them reach their end goal. In fact, one of these informants had provided information about the brothers' involvement in a 1981 murder. And because of this new information, John and Joe were hit with another charge, conspiracy to murder. So, John and Joe decided to create a new, more interesting storyline in their saga, one of their own making. John and Joe had already endured months of informant testimony and prosecutors who kept adding or changing charges in hopes of securing a conviction against them. John had even tried to get himself severed from his brother's case because of his medical disabilities, but he was denied. The brothers were, according to their lawyers, starting to lose faith in the system and didn't see how their upcoming trial in February 1993 was going to be any different than what they had already been experiencing. Still. They tried to make the best of a bad situation. Since 1988 and 1990, respectively, Joe and John were still under house arrest with ankle bracelets to track their every movement. In July 1992, they appealed to the government that enough was enough and wanted the ankle bracelets removed. Surprisingly, the government acquiesced and those confining ankle bracelets were history. But only a couple of months later, on September 1, 1992, the brothers failed to appear in court for their arraignment hearing. Their lawyers and family didn't know where they were or what had happened to them. The only thing that was known was that John was supposedly headed to Houston for a doctor's appointment. But in reality, John and Joe had bigger plans. They decided to jump bail. As a result, law enforcement launched an intense international manhunt for the brothers with a focus on South Florida. According to authorities, the brothers had many friends there who could help them escape to Venezuela where John owed property. John and Joe's names and pictures are splashed on the front pages of newspapers across the world, and federal authorities made sure the general public knew the brothers were very dangerous individuals. To drive the point home, an FBI spokesman told newspapers some time ago they were both involved in a conspiracy to kill an Italian magistrate, a magistrate who was eventually murdered. While well, that seemed to be a widely circulating rumor, it was a rumor that was never substantiated, just like the rumors that Joe and Rosario had to endure back in the early 1980s. Still, the brothers were on the lam, and the government wanted them found, and, as it turns out, it wasn't that hard to find them. Apparently, John and Joe decided to hole up at the secluded and plush South Haven Hotel and Apartments in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a city which John had frequented many times in the past. An unidentified hotel clerk told newspapers that the brothers had been staying at another hotel nearby 
but switched because they wanted a cleaner place. She added that they had registered under different names, one of them signing in as Tony D'Amato from Sicily. They were also sharing a four-room suite for which they paid cash. She also shared that they liked to work out by the pool. Unfortunately, that exposure is what ultimately led to their capture. After 17 days in hiding, John and Joe Gambino were caught and arrested on September 22, 1992. Authorities were searching for a man with a limp because one Florida detective had remembered John walked with a limp when he was surveilled at a meeting with John Gotti in Fort Lauderdale in 1989. John had gotten his limp after he had a stroke in the early 80s. So when the authorities spotted a guy with a limp taking a leisurely stroll off hotel grounds, and even though he had grown a beard, the authorities had a sneaking suspicion they had finally caught at least one of their men. One detective followed John back to the hotel and alerted other members of the task force who then found Joe exercising by the pool. Later, around midnight, FBI agents and Broward County detectives cleared nearby rooms and knocked on John and Joe's door, identifying themselves. When they didn't answer, the agents broke down the door with sledgehammers. The brothers didn't resist, no weapons were found, and authorities took them into custody. Afterward, FBI agent Dan Kingston told reporters, I don't think they left the joint. They were as snug as a bug in a rug. It's an excellent place to hide. You don't stick out in Fort Lauderdale. It's just like Broadway. But at least one guest disagreed. A Danish tourist who was visiting Fort Lauderdale with her son and mother told a Florida paper that the two men did not seem to fit in. My son said they looked suspicious, she told the newspaper, but I thought he had seen too many American movies. And of course, just like a good Hollywood movie, the woman's 16-year-old son ran to watch the events unfold after hearing the commotion. He even videotaped the drama. John and Joe's bail jumping adventure didn't come without consequences either. Not only did they forfeit their combined $5 million bond, but it was another charge that was added to their already lengthy list. Both brothers were returned to New York, but they would have to sit behind bars at the Metropolitan Correctional Center until they went to trial. On February 1, 1993, the trial finally began. Because of their bail jumping adventure the previous September, law enforcement wasn't taking any chances with the very dangerous Gambino brothers. More than a dozen armed federal marshals guarded the shackled brothers as they made their way from the MCC to the courtroom. Additional guards were placed in the hallways and walkways because they knew that the 52-year-old John Gambino, who walked with the limp and a cane, and his 46-year-old brother, would take advantage of any opportunity available to escape from federal custody. It was, perhaps, a bit of overkill on the government's part. In addition, an anonymous jury had been selected because the government alleged that Joe and another defendant had attempted to obstruct justice previously by threatening a witness back in 1990. That witness was supposedly John Zarbano. Authorities also believed that both brothers had previously tampered with the jury in Gambino Capo Eddie Lino's trial. Plus, authorities also claimed that Joe had bribed public officials at one point in order to facilitate the escape of one of the Adamito brothers from the INS in Florida. It's unclear if any of these allegations were proven. In his opening statements, U.S. Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald told jurors a hitman's kit was found in the bedroom of one defendant after a raid on his apartment. Inside a bag in his bedroom, cops found a gun, bullets, and a ski mask. Fitzgerald also implied that John had a hand in two other murders, including that of his brother-in-law, Antonino Inzurillo. This was an allegation based on information provided by Sammy Gravano, and it wasn't even a charge in John's trial. Fitzgerald also tried to paint a picture for the jurors that Joe and John were major drug traffickers who acted as the main distributors of heroin smuggled into the U.S. from Italy and South America. He said that from 1979 through 1989, John's criminal enterprise involved hundreds of millions of dollars in proceeds from the distribution of narcotics, including heroin and cocaine, as well as loan shark and extortion and illegal gambling. Defense lawyers slammed the government's informants almost immediately, telling the jury that informants like Irvana were killers and liars whose only interest was to sweeten their government deal. And as we'll learn, there might be some truth to what the defense lawyers alleged. Former Sicilian mafioso Francesco Marino Manoia, also known as Mozzarella, was a chemist who manufactured heroin in a lab in Beta, Italy. He confessed to committing more than 25 murders while he was a member of the Sicilian Mafia. 
He also admitted that he was the one who had stolen Nativity with St. Francis and St. Lawrence from the Oratory of St. Lawrence in Palermo back in 1969. It was a painting by Caravaggio that is still missing to this very day. John and Joe's trial was the only time Anoya ever testified in the U.S. against any defendant. He was admitted into the WITSEC program after being granted American citizenship in exchange for his testimony against the Gambino brothers. Italy gave him other incentives as well for testifying against alleged Sicilian Mafia members there, including payments of $3,000 a month plus money from his father's pension. He also received $600,000 for giving evidence against Italian politician Giulio Andriotti, who was alleged to have Mafia associations. At trial, Manoia testified that John was the man pulling the strings in the big business of drug trafficking between the U.S. and Italy. He said that he personally manufactured the heroin being sent to the U.S., and more precisely, to Giovanni Gambino. He added that the shipments were sent to John on a regular basis since 1979 after Stefano Bentate had created a partnership between himself, Salvatore Inzerillo, and John. He also claimed that he had personally met with John on at least three different occasions, the last being to show John how the heroin was made. After Manoia's sordid tale, the government put another stellar pentito on the stand. Gaspar Matolo was a former driver and right-hand man of Sicilian mob boss Totorina was sitting in an Italian prison after his conviction in the Maxi trial, where he was on the third year of his 16-year sentence, he decided to flip sides. Matolo had admitted to brutally murdering more than 30 people for which he received immunity from the Italian government, therefore allowing him to live free without fear of ever being convicted for his crimes. Italian authorities were hiding him in an empty convent in the Italian countryside, and at some point, after the failure of Kane and Zurbano, U.S. District Attorneys James Comey and Patrick Fitzgerald flew there to gather any information he might know about the Gambino brothers. And eventually, Matolo came to the U.S. on the taxpayer's dollar to testify. Matolo claimed that he had organized a deal for a 1,000-pound shipment of heroin from Italy to the U.S. in 1981, and that he handed over 500 pounds of the load to John. It was the only testimony he had against the elder Gambino brother. As a side note, Gaspar Matolo later turned to religion and art in an attempt to make up for his past sins, including his self-admitted murder of 30 people, for which he was never convicted. In order to build credibility for the jurors, both Matolo and Manoia had to testify about their past, including an admission to the number of murders they had committed, which between the two of them numbered over 70. But that revelation didn't seem to sit well with the government's ace in the whole witness. In James Comey's 2018 book, The Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership, he stated that Sammy Gravano had read an article about Matolo and Manoia's murder history and wasn't happy. According to Comey, when he met with Gravano in a conference room in New York, Gravano threw a New York tabloid onto the table before Comey with a look of disgust. He then barked, Jesus, Jimmy, you're making me look like a fucking schoolgirl. It appears that Gravano's ego was a bit bruised because compared to Manoia and Matolo's body count, his was rather paltry at only 19. Despite Gravano's bruised ego, Comey knew his buddy held the key to putting the Gambino brothers away for good. And maybe, just maybe, the government could save its very red face after several failure informants. After successfully helping Pugatti away and not wanting to be outdone by Sicilian informants who had a better hit list than he did, Sam Gravano was able to dust off some old memories and tie in John and Joe to a 1981 murder. In April 1993, Gravano detailed the events of the Francesco Oliveri murder that took place in May 1981. He testified that John had gotten permission from John Gotti to kill Oliveri in revenge for him killing another member of John's crew. Gravano claimed that John Gotti told me to go on this hit, supervise it, get it done. He testified that his role was backup shooter as well as supervisor of the hit. His team included Joe Gambino and three others, one of which was an associate who was going to be the shooter as a test before he became a made man. The hit team then gathered surveillance and needed materials including guns, masks, and getaway cars and set the date to take out Oliveri. They had decided to kill him in the morning when he left his house to move his car, a routine he performed daily. The day before the murder, Joe reportedly met with Gravano to finalize the details, and the government even showed the jury surveillance footage of Joe entering the social club where Gravano was supposedly waiting for him. And the day of the plan hit, the team showed up late to Oliveri's home, 
and discovered that Oliveri had already moved his car before they got there. The following week, the team tried again. This time, they solved the problem. It wasn't as juicy as some of the things he testified to in John Gotti's trial, but the government believed Gravano had served his purpose. But while the prosecution thought they had the market on informant witnesses, the defense had a surprise up their sleeve, and it was a biggie. In May 1993, in a surprise move, John and Joe's defense lawyers called Tommaso Buscetta as a witness on their behalf. Buscetta had been a close friend of the Gambino brothers' father back in Italy, and it was also the first time Buscetta had been in New York since his testimony in the Pizza Connection case of the late 1980s. Despite the fact that the Pentito's testimony helped convict over 300 men in Italy in the infamous Maxi trial case and 18 men in the Pizza Connection case, U.S. Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald tried to discredit Buschetta by telling the jury that Buschetta had received immunity from prosecution after admitting to his role in three crimes. Fitzgerald seemed to forget that his own witness, Francesco Manoia, also had an immunity agreement in Italy which required him to cooperate with American authorities. It was the exact same kind of agreement Buschetta had. In addition, Fitzgerald prized witnesses had committed a hell of a lot more than three crimes. In addition, while Gravano was the only one who didn't have an immunity agreement, he did have an agreement with the government, which allowed him to receive monetary benefits from the government, a reduced prison sentence, and placement into the WITSEC program after he served only five years for 19 murders and other crimes. In fact, both Buschetta and Manoia were placed into the WITSEC program as well. And of course, we all know the rest of the history of what happened with Sammy the Bull Gravano. Still, Fitzgerald continued his quest to discredit Buschetta by asking him how many robberies he had committed in his 50 years as a member of the Mafia. Buschetta was a bit taken aback by the question, telling Fitzgerald, I don't know whether you're kidding or not. After all, being completely upfront and honest with the government regarding past history is part of the terms and conditions of becoming an informant and being allowed into the WITSEC program. So, isn't this something that Fitzgerald should have already known, considering how valuable Buschetta's testimony had been? And why would a prosecutor want to discredit the testimony of a man who would help put away so many criminals? Those are questions to ponder, but let's continue our story. During examination by John's lawyer, Buschetta claimed he couldn't remember anything about which lawyer was asking, but he did admit that one man portrayed as a drug dealer actually did not deal in drugs. No information could be found on who that one man was. Now that the jury had all of the information for both sides of the aisle, it was time for them to decide on John and Joe's fate. On June 5, 1993, after a four-month trial, the jury had reached their verdict. The jury was hung 11-1 to 1 on all charges except for one. They found Joe and John guilty of bail jumping, but due to a previous agreement, the brothers would not receive a sentence for that conviction. The jurors presented a note to Judge Leisure to explain their thinking regarding their actions, which he read in the courtroom. They stated that they had taken every avenue afforded us in trying to come to a fair verdict. If there are jurors who sincerely cannot find any witnesses to possess any credibility, then I fear we are wasting the time of many people, including ourselves. Almost immediately, the prosecution crowd foul and asked for a new trial date. But there's an interesting side note about what went on in that jury room. According to the New York Daily News, based on information from a confidential source, juror number eight was becoming suspicious that juror number one was dishonest. On May 29th, during deliberations, juror number eight sent a note to Judge Leisure detailing her suspicions about the holdout juror. She wrote that the jury was deadlocked and the actions of juror number one showed that he had to have been bribed or paid off because he was unwilling to listen to reason and that while he wasn't stupid, he was most definitely corrupt. She even gossiped about juror number one with the other jurors to see what they thought about this individual who wasn't falling into line. Judge Leisure shared the information with Comey and Fitzgerald and eventually called juror number eight into his chambers for a talk. She refused to name the other jurors she talked with, so Leisure segregated her from the other jurors until he could get to the bottom of the drama. He then called in juror number one, and without alluding to his conversation with juror number eight, asked him if he observed any problems in the jury room. Juror number one said that some harsh words had been exchanged, but nothing that would impede a fair and impartial verdict. Eventually, Leisure decided to dismiss juror number eight because he believed she no longer had the capability of being impartial. Perhaps, he speculated, 
She was too young or immature and wasn't able to handle the pressure of sitting on the panel. The next day, Leger announced to the jury that juror number eight was dismissed for personal reasons and that the rest of them would be the ones deciding the outcome. The confidential source told the New York Daily News that what allegedly happened wasn't surprising. If they fixed the case for Gotti, it makes sense that they would try and fix their own. After being told about the allegations, Bruce Cutler, who was representing Joe, told reporters every time the government doesn't succeed, they cry foul. It's just not so. Charles Canese, who was representing a different defendant in the case, told one news outlet that it's very dangerous for prosecutors to label jurors corrupt or incompetent when their verdict is not in accord with what they think the outcome should have been. But to this day, James Comey believes the Gambino brothers paid off juror number one. In his book, he says there were suspicious circumstances surrounding the holdout juror, but didn't elaborate on what those suspicious circumstances were. As a side note, in 2019, Comey was referred for prosecution for leaking sensitive material related to President Trump's political battles. However, the U.S. Justice Department decided not to prosecute the former FBI director despite an internal investigation that found he did, indeed, improperly leak information to the news media. It was clear that the government was not going to stop pursuing their targets. And no matter how many times John and Joe went to trial, the government would continue to cultivate more informants and add more charges until they could secure the convictions against the Gambino brothers they so desperately desired. John and Joe were going to have to face trial again in November 1993 to face the other nine counts of the indictment. It was a never-ending revolving door. So after consulting with their lawyers and family, they decided to end the aggravation and take a plea deal. John and Joe pled guilty to drug trafficking, racketeering, and conspiracy to murder and were sentenced to 15 years behind bars without parole. In an unusual act of kindness, Judge Leisure decided that because of their strong family ties to jail them closer to home so that they could be near their families. The trial was finally over, the sentence was being served, and the smell of freedom was getting closer. In October 2005, a few days before John was to be released from the Devons Federal Medical Center in Massachusetts, where he was serving the last days of his 15-year jail term, he was arrested by U.S. authorities. Even though he was a naturalized U.S. citizen and had already served his time for the same exact crimes he was convicted in absentia for in 1984, Italian authorities had requested John be extradited to Italy for that conviction. After his initial hearing on the matter, he was taken to the Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Plymouth where he would remain for 17 months until the case was resolved. In March 2006, the case came before U.S. Magistrate Marianne Bowler in Boston. Despite John's best efforts to argue his case, Judge Bowler ruled in favor of the extradition because of his narcotics trafficking charges and the fact that he belonged to a criminal association. Later, John appealed the decision and in September 2006, he walked out of prison a free man. U.S. District Judge Reginald Lindsay had overturned Bowler's ruling because John had already served his 15-year sentence in the U.S. and believed he shouldn't have to be jailed again for the same charges in Italy. In 2007, John appealed to a federal court in New York to have his supervised release time reduced for the time he served during the extradition case. Once again, the government vigorously fought John, but Judge Peter Leisure, who presided over John's 1990s trial, sided with the defense and credited him with time served. After his release, John Gambino was never arrested or jailed again. In 2008, John allegedly became part of a three-man panel to oversee the Gambino family after the arrests and convictions of the alleged heads of the family and the FBI's Operation Old Bridge investigation. Besides that, John had, for the most part, led a relatively quiet life after his release from prison. He had many health problems over the years, including a stroke in 1985 and heart surgery in 1987. If he wanted to, he could have become boss of the clan in Italy. He could even have become boss of the Gambino family in New York. He certainly had the smarts and the skill to do it in the style of his cousin, Carlo Gambino. His myriad of health problems might have hindered those aspirations if he had them, but he was happy staying in the shadows as much as he could, running his legitimate businesses and otherwise. John Gambino has been described as a true gentleman, a tough and loyal member of the Gambino family, and a powerhouse who was highly respected and revered by all who knew him. 
Giovanni John Gambino died on November 16, 2017, in bed with his shoes off, surrounded by family and friends. He was 77 years old. As an almost poetic twist to John's story, notorious Sicilian mob boss Toto Rina, with whom John reportedly met in the 1980s, died in prison the day after John on November 17. Rina's death took all the headlines, while John, in death like he did in life, stayed in the shadows. It's time to say goodnight to Napoli Though it's hard for us to whisper on Sarah With that old moon above the Mediterranean Sea In the morning, Signorina, we'll go walking Where the mountains of the moon come into sight And by that little jewelry shop, we'll stop and linger While I buy a wedding ring for you in the meantime, let me tell you that I love you. One of Sarah's signorinas, me good night. One of Sarah's signorinas, kiss me good night.